Thank you very much. Next lecture is by Kende Coman from BC Architects and Studies, coming from Brussels, who is working in con contemporary traditional architecture. Hello, everyone. I will speak also in English. Uh, first of all, thank you to Alejandro and uh, the, all the partners for inviting uh, me uh, to give a lecture today. Uh, first, I want to position a bit our office um, as an architectural practice. So we are uh, architects, we practice. We also teach a little bit at the university, but mainly we practice. And um, in fact, we are a young office which means we are very uh, sensitive for contemporary issues uh, with our society. And uh, what we experience as a young architectural office is that we always have to deal with shrinking budgets while still we have to keep high standards and we want to provide uh, architecture for everyone. So if, if we look at a European or, or a global scale, I think there's really very pressing issues which are at hand uh, to, to build infrastructure for a lot of people who don't have access yet to, to infrastructure, such as housing. And I think there's a, yeah, as an architect, we should always be aware of, of, of that situation. It's not only in Africa, it's also within Europe. There's a lot of people who don't have access to, to uh, good housing, uh, even at this moment. So, um, our office in, in that aspect is, um, is in, yeah, uh, believes in modernism in the sense that uh, modernism, uh, such as Le Corbusier, Miss van der Rohe, uh, was trying to propagate. We, we started to interpret it as a style, but actually in the beginning, I think modernism was about trying to do more for more people with less means. And that, hence the form of the box coming, rectangular forms and, and the abandoning of decoration of certain vernacular typologies. So the concept of modernism, we totally, totally believe in. How modernism was executed, we think there, uh, there is um, improvement to be done. And we think now is the time to start doing a new kind of modernism, which is linked with local typologies in terms of climate, in terms of materials, in terms of crafts, and so on. So I think, f because this morning we were speaking about crafts, for me, um, crafts now, nowadays has a main challenge in how to provide for the many and not for the few. So this lecture will deal a bit with these issues and I will end this lecture with a proposition that we are doing as an architectural office in how to insert crafts for the many. Um, so yeah, I will start the lecture. The lecture is titled The Act of Building. We choose this title because we focus a lot on the process of our uh, of, of, of building. The act is, has two meanings, right? One is the action of building, the, the putting the effort, the energy into it. It's really an action with your hands. The other one is the act in a theatrical sense. We, we actually stage an act together with that specific building community in which a lot of people come together. So there's always an aspect of sensibilization, knowledge transfer, storytelling, which is super important in our society to be able to involve more people to understand which way we have to go in architecture. So BC Architects and Studies, the name says it itself. We are a company, architectural company. Uh, we are, but we are also an NGO, BC Studies which is, in fact, uh, providing expertise, knowledge transfer uh, on uh, working with local materials, such as lime, earth, nature stone, and so on. For our own projects, we combine the two, of course. And we, we use our, our built-up expertise in our own projects, but we also start to consult other architects and other contractors in how to build with local materials in a contemporary way. So our activity has grown from only an architectural office into also a consulting office for other architects and other contractors and other clients. The first project I want to show is our most published project. Maybe some of you will have already seen it. Uh, it's in, located in um, Burundi, which is a country in Central Africa. The red dot is wrong, so you have to look at the arrow. Sorry for that. So it's where the arrow is located. And in fact, um, we are here at a small provincial town, um, like 40,000 inhabitants, that wishes uh, to build with the, the local NGO, together with the Belgian NGO, um, to wish, wish to build a school for deaf children. 
The first project of the School for Deaf Children is the library, which is kind of a pilot project, a very small building, uh, which will be tried and tested in order to learn this kind of construction techniques together with the local community. After this pilot project, the school will build every summer uh, and continue every summer the construction process. Right now, the school is around halfly built, so here you only see the library, but the school at this moment is halfly built and is functioning. So we hope next summer to be able to continue, but it's depending on political factors in Burundi. Um, you immediately see the red color. The red color is very important um, because it shows that the, the building is made from the local earth. It's the same color as the housing of the poor uh, in uh, the town of Muyinga. And, um, but actually we use a different technique. Locally they use always adobes, sun-dried mud blocks. We uh, chose to use compressed air blocks because of their better mechanical properties, but also because of the slicker contemporary look which was needed in order to convince the local community that building with the material of the poor can also be modern and beautiful. So in the end, they were very skeptical. Uh, in the beginning, they were very skeptical. In the end, they were, they were convinced. So, and here, I want to show this picture because um, you, you see here that um, yeah, it's a library for school of deaf children. So we, we also design for uh, children. So this is like a big hammock made from a local sisal plant, which I will talk a little bit later, um, and which is only accessible for the kids. And in this picture, you see on the inside, in fact, all the finishings, except for the ring beam, uh, all the finishings are in fact all local materials from within, let's say, around three kilometers from the site. Yeah, here you see the library and already uh, a little bit of the school. That's the second summer um, and the construction is still going on. And so, yeah, the construction process, the, uh, an act of building, it's not just an architect comes with a plan and then gives it to some contractor and then the contractor builds it. In fact, there are no contractors in Burundi. There's just uh, one uh, master builder, a foreman, who, who helped us. And then people from the local community who are just building on, their, on the community infrastructure. We as architects at that time, we were living in Burundi for eight months. Um, we we um, uh, switched a bit, uh, three months one person, three months another person. We were always with little teams. We also invited students on a volunteering basis to come and join us. So we were uh, with a very diverse group working together on the site on drawings and on construction. Here you see a little bit the, the construction going on. You see that's a very different context from a European construction context. And of course, uh, the, we, when you construct with earth, um, one does the necessary field tests uh, to know what kind of earth uh, we have. The earth of the site was a very high quality laterite earth, which means it holds fr uh, iron. That's why the, the red color, which is a very strong um, earth to build with. Also laboratory tests, which we did in, uh, in Crater, the, the earth school in Grenoble. Um, at the time, one of our partners was uh, doing his uh, masters there. And then once we know the right mixture, the right proportion from earth from the site that we use, uh, we start to uh, make um, compressed air blocks with it. This was a machine, Terstaram, it's a Belgian machine. It was bought by uh, the Belgian government for Burundi and it was somewhere in the dust. It was not used for over 20 years. It was brought there just before the genocide war in uh, 1994. It was really never used. We found it, we repaired it and we decided to use it for, uh, for this project. Here you see the, 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 the different tests that we did. So on the left picture, um, we have a matrix of uh, different mixtures vertically and different water contents while, while producing the blocks horizontally. So in this way, we have like a matrix of performance of the blocks and then in the end, we choose the best block in terms of abrasion, in terms of erosion, in terms of compression force and in terms of flexion. Here you see the test for flexion, where we load um, a certain weight on a block, and the, sorry, and the block cracks like this, so we know how much, if you, you can calculate it, to know the, the megapascal it can take um, in compression and in flexion. Yeah, the local materials, there's local eucalyptus wood, uh, which is locally handled. There's the sisal plant on the right top. The sisal plant was found on site, so while doing site clearing, we gathered the sisal plant 
and made ropes for it, hence the hammock that you saw in the previous picture. There's of course nature stone, and there's the local tile uh, bakery for the roof tiles and the floor tiles. I will just show a quick uh, video, if I can easily find it. I hope the sound will not be too hard. This is uh, Salvatore, the foreman, and uh, here we see um, the groundwork is done by 60 workers in one month. And in fact, this is supporting 60 families in the community. And it's um, one week, it's the same as the price of one week rent of a bulldozer. But we choose, uh, we can also rent a bulldozer from Bujumbura, no problem. But we choose to work with hand labor because it yeah, provides uh, income for, for the local community. So we excavate earth from the side uh, to make a horizontal level and this earth we sieve and we use to make uh, compressed earth blocks. Here you see the sieving process. We mix it with water. Um, we added an earth from 500 meters down the road because our earth was a little bit too clay so we added a bit of sandy earth and then we compress with a Terstaram machine into compressed earth blocks. Here the compressed air blocks are coming out. <coughs> and they are placed on a, a wooden uh, carrier and brought to the, to the area, protected from the rain, where they um, cure. This was a non-stabilized uh, compressed air block, so I have to say when, where they dry, eh? because no cement has been added, no lime has been added. We worked really hard on the composition of the compressed air blocks to make sure that they're really strong and um, fit to use for uh, outside finishing. The blocks are stacked to dry. Of course, if you use compressed air blocks for construction, you minimize the use of cement, which is always imported. Uh, and by saving on cement, uh, one bag of cement is a one week wage for a laborer. So you can imagine how much money we, we, we saved but gave to the people who are working there as a, as a, as a job um, in order to provide for the community. Local eucalyptus beams uh, were cut and they were regrown. Uh, we tried to install a bit of a forest management uh, system with the guy who sells the eucalyptus beams. Here we see the putting of the roof, the roof beams. And then the sizzle plants. So these sizzle plants come from the side and they are um, handled like this. And in fact, they could make simple ropes of it, but not a net. There was one person, a very old craftsman person from the village who knew how to make a net, a small net. And then he, he tried to make this into a bigger one. And it was the first time that he made such a big one. In this process, he trained um, uh, three other guys into making this big net. And this is now the big hammock for the kids to, to play and, and read. So it's again all using local ideas, local crafts, in a contemporary way, in a contemporary architecture, a modern building um, in Burundi. This, here you see all of the group. Uh, yeah, so this is this is a bit the project library of Moyinga. That was uh, our first project. We were just coming out of school. We would have never built something before. Oh, sorry, it's uh, still playing. So we, we had never uh, built something before. So we really invested time in it. This was an unpaid job, and we were living there for eight months and learning about architecture ourselves also, right? We learned so much from Salvatore, the local foreman. So this is a bit like a two-way learning process. Um, this project was published uh, a lot on the internet. Other uh, NGOs found their way to us. So we got other commissions uh, on an ongoing basis with a Good Planet NGO from France. It's the NGO which is headed by Jan Artus Bertrand, the, the, pic, the photographer who takes the aerial beautiful pictures of different landscapes. And um, so they work in Morocco. And uh, this was the first project that we did with them in Aknaibish. So Aknaibish is a town close to the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, to, close to Agadir. This is the town, very small. 
And again, we have the same principle of um, opening up the construction process so that everyone can learn from it. Not only uh, architects come and teach the local community, nor also we learn from the local craftsmen who know how to handle their local materials. For example, lime, gypsum, earth, uh, and so on. So also students were involved in a design studio from the University of KU Leuven who designed uh, on this project together with our office and, ex and went to Morocco, stayed there for three, four months, uh, funded this time by the, by the Flemish government. Um, and so again, an open construction process where everyone contributes and everyone learns. It's a very small project. At all times, these are very small projects. And we had two design briefs. Um, here you see the existing situation, which is like uh, concrete prefabricated elements, which is very weird to use in an arid, dry, warm climate like uh, there in, in Agadir, in Morocco. So these classrooms are really a hell, really. Like in the day, sometimes they cannot use it because it's, it's too warm. So um, the first design brief was to be bioclimatic, which means that you use architecture as a way to regulate your interior climate. And the second design brief was to be seismic proof because we are in a very seismic uh, region. So uh, we had to build a, a classroom with courtyard playground for uh, preschool children, which is uh, three to uh, six, I think. And here we see the, uh, the, the local, this is a picture of uh, what happened in, in, in Morocco decades back. And uh, so, of course, we need to find a, a system to construct seismic proof. So what we did is we inserted ring beams at more levels than just one ring beam at the top, and then um, connecting those ring beams with uh, steel uh, rod bars from the foundation uh, all the way, from the lowest ring beam, the foundation ring beam, all the way to the roof ring beam. Also with materials, of course, uh, we, we are dealing in this African context where everybody wants to build uh, with concrete hollow blocks because that's modernism, right? That's what people think they want. Uh, that uh, signifies wealth and progression, uh, progress. Uh, while we want to propose a contemporary or modern architecture, but with local materials. So we want to be modern, we want to um, uh, embrace progress, but we want to show that tra traditional techniques, traditional materials and typologies can be integrated into a modern architecture. And, we, and this always proves very successful with the, with the local community because they at once have a modern building, but with their local materials. This is a typology that often they don't know yet. So it's something new and they're, they're always very uh, receptive and happy about it. Again, the same principles. We use earth from the site, nature stone from, our, from the river close by. We sieve, we dry, um, uh, and so on. Here we see the river where we get the stones. Um, these are the, the earth from a little bit further that we got. Uh, the, stone, the, the river stones that we will uh, chisel and use for the foundations. And I will skip the video because time is running out. But in the end, we, we have um, an architecture which is uh, bioclimatic in the sense that, um, maybe I have to show another picture. Yeah. Sorry? I can play the video? Okay. Um, so I will go back to the video. This one. So you see a little bit the context like concrete hollow block buildings or concrete prefab buildings. Here we see the foundation being built up, uh, the earth being handled on the sides into adobes. Adobe mixed, we mix it with straw, we mix it with a little bit of sand to make adobes, they dry in the sun. So these are our, our building blocks. We stack them and then this is the first ring beam uh, of concrete on top of the nature stone masonry. Uh, which has, and then you see the vertical uh, rods which run through the ring beams and attach it to the to the roof ring beam. You see here, I will try to show it with the mouse. Yeah. There's one one wall which has a cavity wall, which is the left wall here on this image. The left wall you see a cavity in it. This cavity is uh, in fact a double wall because it's the the west side with very harsh sun. So we want to prevent that the wall gets too warm and radiates the heat to the inside. So only on the south side we have a cavity wall. Um, uh, the southwest side, we have a cavity wall to prevent uh, heating up on the inside. 
for the rest we have openings to the east uh, southeast side and then the, the west side is totally closed um, and the south and southwest side are totally closed. So this is the way how to um, build bioclimatically and arrange an interior climate which is pleasant um, with the architecture. The roof is in earth and the rendering that you see here uh, on top of the adobes is in fact a local product called Nus Nus which is uh, partly earth, partly gypsum. This depends a little bit in which region you work in uh, Morocco. Sometimes they use uh, lime earth or lime gypsum. Here in this region they use uh, uh, earth gypsum for uh, uh, external rendering. And then you see that again we, have, we achieve a kind of a modern contemporary architecture um, with local techniques, local craftsmanship, local materials. Okay, I will stop this one. So, oh, just thinking a little bit maybe. Yeah. So here in the end, uh, just you know the beautiful architectural pictures, of course, and uh, that's that's always good to communicate a project. But what's what's very important for us is also how it was built, the process, the act of of the building itself. And in the end, uh, we arrive with, a, with an architecture to be proud of, like, we, because everyone feels engaged. Uh, a lot of people were involved, a lot of families were involved in the construction process. Uh, and and in, the end, in the end, they have a beautiful uh, building that everyone is proud of. You see the foundation system, which is also a local typology, uh, to have um, inclining foundations like this. And uh, the, the ring beams run through the, like, below or above windows, so we arrange the windows in between seismic uh, ring beams. So, um, these projects in, uh, in Africa were our first projects and then afterwards we kind of returned back to Belgium, to Europe, and we were thinking like this is a way of, of, you know, of building that we also want to do in Europe, but of course we're in a total different construction context, so how, how to do this? So we, that's what we're mainly working on now. We are, we are doing and, and have, have uh, done uh, several projects in uh, Europe, which also deals with this way of construction, always opening up the construction process with knowledge transfer to the contractor, uh, to participants, to architects who wants to join in the construction process, and to build exemplary landmark buildings in Earth. For example, this is a watchtower in Belgium. It's the first uh, public uh, building in the Benelux, which is made of earth from the site. So it's 12 meters high, rent earth uh, principle. And it's really like uh, uh, yeah, the, the first building of its kind in, um, in, in the Benelux. We were not the architects for this project. We were the earth consultants. So we guided the earth consultancy for the designer, but also for the contractor. So we were actually on the site, building together with the contractor and with people who were interested in this, in this technique, who joined the, the construction process. So this shows already a little bit the shift that we also make from architecture towards expert or consultant towards builder. This is another project in Belgium. Again, very, very modern architecture. This is an architect's house, an architect who builds for himself and he wanted to have a rent earth wall in the middle. The house is not yet finished. There will be stairs linking the platforms and then uh, platforms like this. But it shows a wall of 15 meters high uh, made from local earth from the site. And to my knowledge, this is the highest contemporary uh, rent earth wall uh, that I know. Uh, it's 15 meters high. If you know higher, I would like to know, so uh, tell me. But we're very, we're very proud of this project because it symbolizes for us a way of how to do uh, crafts construction within a European context. We always work with a different economical model because if you have to do this with all professionals and you have to pay everyone 50 euros an hour, it, it just doesn't work. So we open up the construction process because we want to sensibilize, we want to have knowledge transfer, we want to, have to know to, that a lot of people know about earth construction. And in this way, we organize workshops in order to, to construct um, these contemporary uh, earthen projects. This is another project ongoing. Right now, they're making the, the masonry. Um, uh, with these blocks, these are compressed earth blocks, 19,000 blocks have been produced in a workshop of three weeks with 30 people in Belgium. Again, the same idea, crafts for contemporary architecture in a different economical model, because if you do it on a, in, a, in a classical economical model, it just doesn't work. And then all these projects where we are actually on the construction site has led, this is my last slide, has led to this uh, a new um, idea that we have, 
Right now, we just got word that we received subsidies from the Flemish government to start a new company, which is actually um, a, a Belgian cooperative for materials, which will be a material production company for earthen, earthen construction materials in Belgium, always using earth from the site. So it has to deal with circular economy, uh, urban mining, because this is about a Brussels project. We're going to use earth from very big construction sites in Brussels, and we're going to use that, that earth. There's a very strong clay in Brussels. We're going to use that earth to make um, uh, materials. So again, we're trying to innovate crafts, right? To make it work in our contemporary society with shrinking budgets, with a booming population, with a lot of issues to solve. Uh, that, that's a bit our approach how to do it. We try to find new economical models, uh, new practices to, to uh, integrate uh, crafts in, in a contemporary construction sector. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.